All right, hello everyone. Thank you, thank you so much, everyone, for for being here. Um, I wanted to um, start out with um, uh, start out with a little quiz um, for everyone. I'm gonna I'm gonna read a um, a product's ingredients, and we'll see if anyone can figure out what that product is. Okay, so you ready? It's going to take a while, so just bear with me. Um, enriched fla bleached flour, water, palm and or soybean oil, high fructose corn syrup, salt, maltodextrin, apple puree, cornstarch, dextrose, modified cornstarch, dry yeast, hydrogenated palm oil, salt, whey, strawberry puree, baking powder, I'm about halfway through, corn syrup solids, citric acid, mono and diglycerides, sodium citrate, egg yolk, potassium sorbate, sodium benzoate, TBHQ, citric acid, xanthan gum, natural and artificial flavor, polysorbate 60, guar gum, locust bean gum, red 40, blue one, sucralose. Baby food, oh my gosh. Thankfully it's not, no. That's, no. Cereal bars, close, close. Someone said chips. Not, Pop-Tarts is, is close. Here, I'll put the. Did you, did you see the slide before? No. That's really, no one's ever gotten that. Toaster strudel. Yeah. Here. Here are the ingredients, and here's, uh, you can see all the ingredients. The interesting thing is a strawberry toaster strudel. Um, and the interesting thing about this is you look at this product and you wonder, well, is there any real food in here? And you, and you look at the ingredients, and you have to look pretty closely at it, and you can kind of see, you know, and by food I mean a whole food. Um, apple puree, yeah, that's, kind of, that's kind of a food, you know, it depends on how they make it. And then there's strawberry puree, so that's where they're obviously getting the strawberries from. Egg yolk, that's a food. But after that, that's about it. Um, there's not much else in there that can be um, really considered, considered food. And, but if you it, look at the front of the package, you get a whole different story, right? You see um, a ripe strawberry in there. And you wonder, I mean, how... I wonder how many strawberries you would have to eat, um, or how many toaster strudels you would have to eat to equal one strawberry. Um, my guess is about like 29, maybe. Um, and then you see in big letters, right? It's one of the first things that you would see if you looked at this package, made with more fruit. But here's the interesting thing about that. If you look, so if you go back to the other ingredient list, the fruit you see is under the category, and the fruit is apple puree and strawberry puree. Um, contains 2% or less of the following. So if it contains more fruit, it's at 2% now, including all these other ingredients. Um, what was it at before? You know, 0.5%, less than a percent of fruit. So it's very, it's, it's, it's very misleading, and this is just one example of um, the types of things that processed food makers do to paint a, um, a more glowing and, and very misleading picture of what their products actually are. And it would be a very different story if there had to be real truth in labeling and food told the story of what really, this is a bit maybe what it would look like if you told what was really in, in the, behind that packaging. <laughs> so, three kinds of sugar with oil. Um, so there are, unfortunately, there are lots of toaster strudel type products in the grocery store. I mean, I just picked pick that one in particular because I think the name toaster strudel is completely ridiculous. Um, the, the average supermarket is filled with 43,000 different, different items. And just to give a perspective on the, um, over time, in 1970, the average grocery store had about 8,000 items. So there's been this incredible supersizing of our food choices and, and of the supermarket. And you have to wonder, uh, you, you have to ask the question, are our lives any better because of this? The fact that we now have you know, 40,000 or so different 
um, additional types of products, does this make our lives any better? Does it make our grocery shopping any easier? Um, I would argue that it, it actually makes it harder. So you, have, you, you walk down the supermarket in these, these large uh, canyons of an aisle and, and it's just crowded with, with um, an overwhelming number of, of products, and, and many of which are deeply confusing to people, to supermarket shoppers. So, um, so you have to wonder, what is all this stuff that we're, that we're eating? Um, and what's, what's really in it? And that's one of the things that I, I want to talk about today, and it's, um, it's one of the things that, I, that prompted me to, um, to want to write my book. But first, I think we have to ask, um, how, did we, how did we get here? Um, one of the first places that it started was a, was a town called Battle Creek, Michigan. Um, and here is a guy, it, as, as is so often the case, um, with, with innovation, it's, it's, it's someone who starts out with, with good intentions. This was a guy, John Harvey Kellogg. Um, he started a, a place that now would be considered kind of like a, a, um, a yoga retreat um, spa facility. And lots of celebrities came there and he treated people with all kinds of um, diseases. Um, it became very famous at the time. This is around the um, late 19th century, turn of the 20th century. Uh, it was called the sanatorium. And one of the things, he had lots of ideas about health, many, many of which were completely nutty and wrong, but one of the things he was right about was that um, people needed more fiber in their diets. At the time, especially the upper classes, people were eating a lot of meats um, throughout the day, including for breakfast, and this was causing all kinds of health problems. So he created, um, he created, um, he was vegetarian, he was a Seventh-day Adventist, and um, he created what became the first breakfast cereal. He wanted people, after they left the sanitarium, to be able to go home and, and have um, a product, at least for breakfast, that was as healthy as what they were eating when they were staying with him. So he experimented with wheat flakes, and he, um, he baked them and um, uh, soaked them and rolled them out. Um, and came up with a, a product that he called Granose. Um, and it probably, it was very healthy. It was made with um, whole uh, wheat flakes. He didn't add much to it. Um, it probably tasted like cardboard, uh, but very healthy. And eventually, he and his, bro his brother joined him um, in this endeavor, his younger brother. And eventually, they um, started experimenting with the product, made it taste a little better, and started using corn, and it became corn flakes. So really one of the first enduring um, convenience foods um, that, that was created around the, the turn of the 20th century. Um, but one of the problems with, with cornflakes, once it became, um, once it started to, to um, gain in popularity and lots of people started buying it and they started distributing it beyond just Battle Creek and they started distributing it throughout the Midwest um, to lots of different grocery stores, um, there was a problem. Because it wasn't, you weren't, suddenly you weren't getting a, a fresh product that had come right off the assembly line, which was, you know, a very small assembly line at the time. But, um, and you would open the box and there would be um, this kind of awful smell, this rancid, rancid smell. And what was happening was that the Kellogg brothers were using the whole uh, corn kernel to make these corn flakes. So they were, they were relatively healthy. It was a whole grain cereal. Um, but as a result, um, because there was, there was a certain shelf life needed, it would be sit, sitting around for, for weeks or even months, um, it would, uh, the, the, the oil in, in the corn would start to, would start to turn and, and go rancid. So what the Kellogg brothers did, or at the time it was, it was just his brother, um, Will Keith Kellogg, who went on to um, run the Kellogg company for many, many years, um, what he did was a very interesting and revealing example of one of the inherent trade-offs in processed food. He, um, he ended up taking away the germ um, and the bran of the corn and using just the starchy middle, what he called um, the sweetheart of the corn. He used this you know, in marketing. He decided he was going to um, use the starchy, um, um, the switch to the, just the starchy part of the corn as a marketing, uh, a marketing tool. And it was very, very effective. But what they didn't, and what they probably didn't know at the time, because not much was known about vitamins at that time, you know, around 1907, um, they um, ended up basically taking away all the nutrition that would have been in cornflakes, all the, the vitamins, the fiber, um, all the good stuff that's, that would have been in cornflakes was removed um, in order to make way for a longer shelf life. So just a very re revealing example of what happens when you try to um, create convenience foods and, and processed foods. And this was something that happened very early on. Um, 
Another early example of processed food was um, processed cheese. In um, 1915, this was a man named um, James Kraft. He was a, a Canadian guy. He was a cheese seller in Chicago, which meant he would go around um, to all these cheese markets and collect cheese with his horse and buggy early in the morning and deliver it to all these grocery stores. At the time, there was you know just mom and pop grocery stores. There was no um, um, there was no Safeway, um, so it was it was very um, inefficient distribution. And so he um, he noticed very quickly that there were these um, inefficiencies with with cheese. There was no there was very little refrigeration at the time, even at grocery stores, and the cheese would um, there was you know these big wheels of cheese which you can still so sometimes find in, in like Whole Foods. I'll have them on display. Um, and the um, and people would when they buy cheese, um, the grocers would cut off a, a wedge of the cheese. So overnight there was no you know there was no packaging, and the cheese would go um, would harden, and then the grocer would have to cut it off the next morning. So they were wasting a lot of cheese. And then in the summer months, it was um, the cheese would would start to oil and, and and go bad. And and he thought, gosh, wouldn't it be great? if we could make a cheese, if there was some way to make cheese um, last forever, that wouldn't go bad. So he experimented with this. He heated um, a bunch of shredded cheese uh, for a certain period of time at a certain temperature, stirring it constantly, and came up with what we now know today as, as processed cheese. And originally, first it was sold in um, these tins, these three ounce tins, and in his, his patent that he filed in 1915, he called it permanently keeping. And, um, and sterilized. And this was actually a good thing. People, um, you know, today we look at that and we think, well, who wants sterilized cheese? You know, but at the time, there wasn't a lot of consistency in, in food. Sometimes when you bought cheese, it, um, it had like a certain crunchy taste to it. Sometimes it was creamy. Um, you, you know, you didn't know how, how old it was or if, um, uh, there, there just wasn't a lot of um, standardization of food, so people loved this. The fact that they could buy one of these craft tins, keep it in their pantry for months and months and months, if not years, and it would taste the same every time. Um, it was a, in an era when this technological um, modernity was um, was embraced um, at the time. Factories were were something that was was seen as seen as a positive thing. Um, uh, but there was a there was a trade off here in in. Um, so you had this you had this extra shelf life the cheese would last would last forever but what Kraft probably also didn't realize at the time is that cheese processed cheese actually has twice the sodium of um, natural cheese or, or regular cheese um, so you know you're just you're getting and some of that is not some of it's coming from the the salt that's being added to make it taste taste better because you've killed all the flavor in the cheese and some of it's coming from the sodium additives sodium citrate and um, um, I forget the one other. Uh, anyway, there's a couple so sodium-based additives in there that don't contribute any taste, don't help it taste better, but are just in there um, for uh, for food processing purposes as as emulsifiers, and they contribute sodium. Um, and in case you're wondering, yeah, in case you're wondering what um, how long craft singles will last, I. Um, just started this experiment when I when I first started writing about food. Uh, about, it was about 10 years ago now, I started wondering about expiration dates on packages. And I thought, you know, what would happen when if, you know, these, these bars or the cereal or this package of, um, of processed meat, um, what happens after the expiration date? And I started collecting a lot of them in my, in my office. Actually, at the time, it was in my apartment in New York City. And one of the things I collected was, uh, were craft singles. And so here are my craft singles um, at age four, after four years. There are, um, there's no mold whatsoever. If you can see, there's like little crystals on them. And those are apparently um, lactose crystallizing, just the lactose that's, that's in cheese. Um, they've basically turned to plastic. Um, it's very, it's hard, it resembles, um, it's, it's still the very bright orange color. And it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a very, it's, you wouldn't want to eat it, but there's, but there's no mold. Um, basically, craft singles will never, will never mold. And they're not actually um, cheese. If you actually look on the, on the package of, um, of Kraft Singles, it'll say pasteurized prepared um, cheese product. Well, for a while, it was actually called pasteurized prepared cheese food. And then in, in 2003, Kraft added another ingredient, um, milk protein concentrate, that actually required it by the FDA. They were required to change it from 
um, pasteurized prepared cheese pr food to pasteurized prepared cheese product. So effectively downgrading it from a food to a product, making it even less cheese. Um, but these were all things that at the time when they were developed made people's lives um, a little bit more convenient and they were, they were her heralded. And here's, an, here's one of my favorites. Uh, the, the way food manufacturers would tout the, um, the technology in their, in their food. This was puffed rice, which was one of the early breakfast cereals as well, shot from guns. And it's actually a, a gun puffing machine that was, used, that was created. The first iteration of it was actually a can cannon um, from the Civil War. And um, it's still, there's, gun puffers are still used in cereal manufacturing. But, you know, no cereal manufacturer would ever uh, think to put this on the cover, right? I mean, they put fields of wheat and corn and farmers and barns and all these sort of agrarian and pastoral images because they want to highlight the connection it has to the farm, which is, you know, a very tenuous connection. But they would never think to put gun puffers on the, on the front of a package. So, and... And at one point in time, um, one of the other early breakfast cereals, C.W. Post's Grape Nuts, um, had a, uh, a little um, a message on the packaging that said, factory always open to visitors, uh, which I thought was fascinating because when I was doing my research and trying to go into some of these, these uh, cereal factories, uh, none of the four big cereal manufacturers, nobody would let me inside their, their cereal factories to see how cereal is actually made. So that's been a, um, uh, a completely um, transformed policy by the cereal makers. So, but these were, the, these were early days for, for the food industry. Things didn't really start to ramp up until after World War II when the food manufacturers used their preserving and packaging technologies that they'd used to create war rations. Um, they, when they started to use those in the public market, they really ramped up their, their production and their, their selling techniques. Um, and, and that's when they started a, a concerted effort to try and get American housewives, because it was how, at the time it was house, it was women housewives that were doing all the, the food preparation and cooking, a concerted effort to try and get them to just stop cooking so much and to use um, processed products and use the food manufacturers as um, um, uh, to to rely on them for. Um, you know, doing, doing some of their cooking, which I'm sure housewives at the time welcomed. And here's, here's a, um, I love old ads because they're just this wonderful um, time capsule view into the past. So this, if I can get it to play, let me see, okay. So this is, a, yeah, Swanson um, TV dinner ad from, from 1955. Wow. Now, you gals think you're lucky you can get Swanson TV turkey dinners, but I say Swanson TV turkey dinners are a bigger break for husbands. Now, you take me. I can be early, I can be late, I can bring pals to dinner anytime I please, and get this, my wife never panics. She just takes Swanson TV turkey dinners from the freezing compartment of our refrigerator when I'm a little off schedule. Oh, and right you are, Jack. And that is because Mary Lou knows that she can have a, a swell dinner ready in just 25 minutes. Right. And talk about easy. Well, she just pops Swanson TV turkey dinners in a hot oven. You know, they're oven ready in individual heat and serve trays. With Swanson TV turkey dinners, you just heat and serve, and you serve big and hearty slices of moist, tender Swanson turkey with grand giblet gravy and special cornbread dressing and fluffy whipped sweet potatoes with golden Swanson butter mm. and garden fresh peas with more butter. Mm. Mm. Mother yeah. Murphy, lucky <laughs> me. My wife uses Swanson TV turkey dinners. And make your husband lucky too. Get Swanson TV turkey dinners, Swanson TV fried chicken dinners, Swanson TV beef dinners from your grocer's big freezer. So, yeah, swell dinner. Um, so those, those were the, the early days of a concerted effort by the food industry to get people to, to stop cooking so much. And around that time um, was when um, McDonald's became a national success story. Their, their first store was in 1955 in Illinois. Um, and within 10 years, there were 700 stores. By 1983, there were 6,000 stores. And for the next two decades, the company opened about 360 locations every year. Um, 
And today they have about 14,000 McDonald's outlets in, in the US, uh, many more globally. And today, they're in, in total, for all the fast food change, there's 232,000 um, fast food stores or restaurants, if you can even, I don't even really call them restaurants, but um, representing about $200 billion in revenue. So a big, a big um, shift in, in, in how people are, are eating. Um, took place over those just those those three or four decades, and you know so we're at the point now where this is from a, a Gallup survey in 2013. It shows eight in ten Americans report eating at fast food restaurants at least monthly, and about half of those, or 40 percent of Americans, um, eat at fast food weekly. So that's a really big representation of, of, of the population, S even still, even now. This is from 2013, so about two years ago. And then the, the even more amazing thing is that, is the, 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 in this survey, um, people were asked about how they feel about fast food. And most people said, yeah, I know it's kind of crappy, but I eat there anyway. 76% um, of people said, that the food served in fast food restaurants is quote unquote not too good or not good at all for you. So people, people know they have a, at least a conceptual notion of what is and what isn't nutritious and, and good for them. But a lot of people have not, it's, it's very different from, from internalizing it the way maybe a lot of, a lot of people, a lot of you and people at this conference have and made it an emotional, um, emotionally connected um, understanding of, of what it means, the connection between our food and, and our health. I think people think, yeah, it's not that good for me, but, you know, it's not going to kill me. I'll, I'll be fine. Um, which is, you know, if you're eating it, you know, moderately, it's, it, you're probably right about that. But if you're eating it regularly and you're eating it a couple times a week, that's absolutely not the case. Um, so we're now at the point where when you look at the, the mountains of food in grocery stores and all the consumption at fast food restaurants, um, we're at the point where 70% of our calories, this is the average American diet, 70% of our calories are coming from processed food, which is the, the highly processed food that we've been talking about.